I think the biggest thing to avoid is inflammatory foods. I, I think sugar isn't that much of a threat to the body compared to in, infl inflammatory foods. And of course, sugar can be inflammatory if it's abused. But fats, bad fats and bad protein is way more inflammatory than sugar. The other thing too is if you take proteolytic enzymes on an empty stomach, let's say when you're fasting, it's a great idea because they'll actually go into your body, go into your bloodstream and actually start breaking down old undigested proteins which might be accumulating in the cells or even creating inflammatory or allergic responses. Do you want to know what it is? Body, mind, empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter, quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind. Welcome to the Body Mind Empowerment Podcast. I'm your host, Seamland, and our guest today is Matt Gallant. Matt is the CEO of Bioptimizers and has a bachelor's degree in kinesiology. He's been a strength and conditioning coach for multiple pro athletes and he's a self-defense instructor. Matt, welcome to the show. Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of your show, and uh, we met we met at the Bulletproof Conference, and here we are. So, yeah, really yeah, it was great to meet you in person, and uh, like uh, it was in the beginning of April. So it's been a few uh, weeks. Uh, yeah. what, what 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 have you been up to like since that time? Um, yeah, I've been been uh, busy and focused. Um, we're you know really diving into some exciting new uh, ingredients and in research, and uh, doing a lot of tests. So I'll, I'll talk more about that later. But, uh, you know, I've been doing keto for 26 years <laughs> on and off, but right now I'm, I'm on, I've been on nonstop for four years. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I started experimenting with keto when I was 16. Um, first, first it was Atkins. I had gained some weight and I heard about Atkins, but then a few months later I discovered the anabolic diet by Moro mm -hmm. Di Pasquale. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's still what I follow today, which is a cyclical keto. You do five or six days of keto and then one day of carb loading, which is really anabolic for muscle building. So we can talk about that, or the mm. benefits of that. But uh, yeah, that's uh, what I've been up to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, like uh, I also remember uh, reading the book by Dr. Dip what was his name? Like the Pasquale or something. Yeah. yeah just and, Pasquale. And, and like the anabolic diet or the cyclical keto diet has been around like for decades, like in the uh, 50s already bodybuilders were using it like Vince Gironda was steak and eggs diet was a cyclical keto diet and yeah different different versions of it are popping all the time uh, but yeah, I think bodybuilders in general I, I don't consider myself a bodybuilder I mean I, I probably built 50 60 pounds of, of lean muscle mass uh, since I've been working out um, but you know bodybuilders as a, as a group are probably some of the most hardcore I mean, you can call them biohackers. Mm. Uh, they're just willing to do anything to get a result. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which a lot of times is to sacrifice their health. And I think that's, that's where I don't identify with them. But their willingness to experiment with their bodies and try things, I think, is as extreme as it gets. So mm. they're, they're a good, it's a good place to learn a lot of things from. Yeah, like it's so true. Yeah, they're self-experimenters. But you don't really want to be that guy who is pushing the envelope, so to say, because who knows what's going to happen. And, and you, you want to kind of look at, the, okay, what's the results based upon them? Let them, let them be the guinea pigs. But like you said, though, Vince Duranda, what he would do, which was interesting, um, again, it was a cyclical approach. He would get guys on really high fat diets for about three weeks, three to four weeks, and then he'd switch them over into a vegetarian diet for about 10 days and uh, was getting great results. I mean, arguably Vince was, you know, a decade ahead of his time when he was training people. Um, so yeah, mm. he, he was a genius, definitely way ahead of his time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, but uh, when I was talking like, with your business partner, Wade Lightheart, uh, mm -hmm. a few uh, months ago uh, on this podcast as well, and he was saying that he's doing a vegetarian diet and you're doing keto, so uh, how do you yeah. how do you get along with each other? <laughs> um, we get along great, you know. Um, yeah, it's, that's a great question, and we've actually like debated it pretty deeply. So first of all, I, I think the number one consideration for everybody when you're doing a diet is is it sustainable? And sustainability is uh, a really big topic because you know the spiritual side of a diet, which for me, there's no real spiritual side to a diet, but for Wade, there is. 
um, becomes his number one consideration, right? So sustainability also means, you know, can I psychologically handle um, eating like this for the rest of my life? Because I'm not interested in doing things that are not sustainable, like doing something for 12 weeks, knowing that I can't sustain it. I, I've never been able to really do that. And even as a coach, when I used to train a lot of people, um, that was always my approach. So there was that side of it. Um, I think we both mastered the diets because I, I think both diets require, I mean, the general concept's really simple. If you're vegetarian, eat vegetables. If you're keto, avoid carbs. But, you know, this is what we'll get into today. Uh, the mastery is in the details. So for an example, with Wade, he eats enough protein. Like he under, his, his, his awareness around protein and his commitment to making sure that he gets enough of it on a daily basis is critical because when he doesn't, he doesn't feel as good. He'll lose strength. He'll lose muscle. Um, and the same thing goes with keto. You know, there's a lot of refinements that mm. I think most people can make to make the diet work better for their bodies. So I think that, uh, you know, we've both been on these diets for a very long time. Wade's about 18 years. I mean, like I said, 26. So, you know, and what's great too is these days, the science of these diets is getting uh, fleshed out, right? The, the, the research that's coming out, our understanding of how to make these things work is uh, light years ahead of 26 years ago where, hey, just eat cheese and uh, Atkins bars, right? Uh, that didn't work that well. For sure. Yeah, it's so true that uh, your diet is going to kind of change your perspective on the world as well. And like you mentioned, uh, Wade is kind of more mindful about uh, how how much protein is he getting and making sure that he gets enough of the essential nutrients and such versus someone on keto is just more mindful about, okay, I, I shouldn't overdo the carbs or something. I'll just pay attention to uh, the carbohydrates and avoid them. Uh, and, you know, the same applies to like different diets. Like a bodybuilder is also very kind of mindful about meal timing and protein and, and et cetera. So it's, yeah, kind of fascinating how your diet is going to change your perspective of the world and uh, kind of the way you move or navigate the world and uh, move through it as well. Yeah, I think, and I think that's where fasting, actually, I think the biggest benefit of fasting is what you just said. Um, I remember that because I do a lot of fasting as well. And we can get into that. But I remember the first time I did like a five day fast, um, you know, you, you really realize, first of all, how much mental energy people spend more I was spending thinking about food right I mean mm -hmm. the stand that the, the average person wakes up they're hungry they eat they're already thinking what am I going to eat for lunch what am I going to eat for mm -hmm. dinner they spend time eating then they spend time cleaning the food then they spend time thinking about the food then they repeat that process for lunch and mm -hmm. repeat that process for dinner um, you know again I just spent time with my parents in, in Canada and, you know, that's their process, right? Like, what are we going to eat for lunch? What are we going to eat for dinner? Yeah. But when you start fasting or even just eating one meal a day, which is what I do, um, like you just realize, wow, how much, how much energy and mental uh, thinking is being spent thinking about food, preparing the food, eating the food, cleaning the food. Um, so, the, yeah, and when you start fasting for days on end, um, you have to go to a different place. And it changes you, you know, because really – at the end of the day, our nervous systems are designed to keep us safe, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason most people struggle with fasting is they have not overcome that biological response, which is telling them, you're going to die unless you feed me, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, they don't understand that, no, you, you can get past that. That's just ghrelin telling your brain to eat. And it's in a way, it's an illusion, right? Like we know we can go 10 days and 20 days. And I know two people that have done 40 day fast. Mm -hmm. um, so again, that, that response, that ghrelin response, which is telling us we're hungry is just an illusion, but mm -hmm. it's our bodies just trying to keep us safe. So there's something really powerful and empowering about being on a multiple, multiple day fast and uh, realizing that, you know what, I am safe. And, mm -hmm. and it just changes, it changes your nervous system. It's, just, it's quite profound in my opinion. Yeah, it's so true that uh, fasting is going to change the way you kind of relate to food and you kind of learn how to intuitively differentiate between like psychological hunger and physiological cravings and just eating for boredom and such. And I like what you said 
and like that you kind of overcome your fears as well. So the only way you overcome your fears is to plunge into the unknown and uh, go into the chaos where you haven't been before. So yeah, for most people that the, or the biggest kind of source of, let's say, uncertainty and angst is not going without food <laughs> because it's so kind of used to the or it's so um, very common for people to just eat and never, never, ever go into like a fast state. Yeah, even my mom, <laughs> you know, my parents, uh, my brothers and I joke, uh, you know, for, <laughs> the joke is 4.30 p.m. for life because they eat at 4.30 p.m. their dinner like clockwork, right? Like <laughs> when they're at home, it doesn't, you know, five minutes late is a big deal. And uh, we went to Montreal. My brother was graduating, becoming a doctor. So we were off schedule, but for them, not like waiting for an hour was such a huge mental deal. <laughs> yeah. I was like, you know, we had to like, oh my God, we got to feed them because they're panicking. So <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's really interesting how people relate to food. But I think in terms of mental energy, um, one of the things I try to do as an entrepreneur and just to be more successful in life is to free up mental energy. And I think that's the big benefit of fasting in terms of, I mean, obviously there's all the health benefits, which are amazing, mm -hmm. but you know, cutting my mental energy by 80% thinking about food is, is huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned you're doing a one meal a day. So uh, mm -hmm. can you dissect it? Like what, what is, what is it and uh, when? Okay. So um, yeah, let's go deep here. Um, and, and again, this is my diet. It's certainly not for everybody. It's pretty extreme uh, on multiple levels. Uh, but I'm, this is what works for me. And just, just to be clear, let's just determine what my goals are. Um, my goals are one to, con to continuously build lean muscle mass, which I have been for the last four years. I, I build about four to eight pounds of lean muscle mass a year using uh, DEXA scans and to continually get leaner, but on a slow pace, I'm not into extreme uh, weight loss. I've done that. I've lost 64 pounds in 14 weeks once. Uh, that oh. was a big mistake. Um, so, you know, every year I lose, you know, four to eight pounds of fat. I gain four to eight pounds of lean muscle mass. And my other goal is maximum health and energy. Um, so anyways, those are the, the goals. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, um, what I've found that works well for me is again, number one, it's a cyclical keto. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I eat one meal a day. It's keto. Um, like usually almost like carnivore. I mean, like Monday, so it's a pound of ribeye. Uh, Tuesdays, I'll eat some salmon and a little bit of veggies. Today, I'm going to eat a pound of uh, ground lamb mm -hmm. with a little bit of goat cheese. And then tomorrow, I'll eat a big salad. So one meal a day. Usually, I work out at four and then I eat it at six. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I stop eating Thursday night. So Thursday night's usually my last meal until Sunday morning. So that gives me about a 60 hour fast. Nice. Um, so I get the autophagy mm. and you know, not that it's magical, but for me, it's a great way to manage a calorie deficit. Like if I want to lose body fat, all I have to do is, is do that 60 hour fast and I'll lose about a pound of fat a week. Mm -hmm. um, if I start eating on those days, then I, my fat loss will diminish, obviously. And then Sunday is designed to do several things. It's a massive calorie day and it's a massive carb day. Mm -hmm. So when you're depleted, when your body's completely depleted of carbs, and we're never completely depleted, but you know we're, we're highly depleted. When we start eating carbs, um, they're going they're going to be shuttled into the muscle, especially the more muscle mass you have, the more carbs you can drive in there. So instead of experiencing gluconeogenesis, where the carbs get turned into fat, they get driven into the muscle. But the other thing that happens is insulin obviously goes through the roof. And because we've been fasting and eating keto, we're quite insulin sensitive. Mm -hmm. And very few people know this outside of bodybuilding circles, but insulin is one of the most anabolic hormones yeah. on the planet. And most pro bodybuilders use insulin to actually like they'll inject insulin to maximize the anabolic response. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a huge anabolic response. Also the stress of the high calorie day will increase growth hormone. And then again, that's the original anabolic diet design mm -hmm. by, by De Pasquale, which is let's stress the body with a lot of calories, a lot of carbs. Let's get the insulin high 
let's get the growth hormone high. And um, it, that's where the muscle building comes in. But there's some other benefits as well. One is psychological for me. Um, you know, I like being able to go and, and go to restaurants and, and eat fun food for that one day. And the other benefit is metabolism, right? So by doing that, we crank our leptin as well. And uh, I know a lot of guys that have been doing um, this cycle diet approach. And there's a great book written on this topic called Cycle Diet by Scott Abel. And Scott is one of the top bodybuilding coaches of all time. And, you know, he doesn't do keto, but what he does do is a six-day calorie deficit with a one-day of massive calories. Um, and he's been doing that for a couple of decades. And it's a great way to stay lean and to preserve and even gain muscle mass. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you just keep your calories low all the time, your metabolism will get slower and even potentially your body will get catabolic, which means you're losing muscle mass, which is not, never a good thing. Mm -hmm. So, so I feel like I'm getting the best of all worlds by doing this approach. Um, I'm, again, I get the keto benefits. I get the energy benefits from keto. I get the autophagy for 60 hours, um, plus, plus the 22, 23 hours a day from Monday to Thursday. Mm -hmm. And then I get the muscle building effects of the massive carb load day. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been working well. Again, for me, this is what works. Mm -hmm. This is very extreme to the average person, all of it, but, uh, yeah. that's what I do. Yeah, sounds sounds really awesome, and uh, I'm I would also say it's really dialed down, and uh, like the uh, original anabolic diet and the steak and egg diet are also very similar, but they don't incorporate the fasting. So you definitely like would your 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 example is going to definitely have like a higher level of autophagy, and uh, and yeah, like you said, you're all getting like the best of uh, all the worlds. You're getting keto benefits, you're getting the uh, increased leptin benefits, increased metabolism, and as well like the like you said the the anabolic effects of insulin are really something to not mess around with and there's a reason why bodybuilders eat a bunch of carbs and to maximize the anabolic response of eating all the time so yeah for for like most people i would say doing it in a cyclical manner is just so much better than chronically elevating insulin with like high eating frequency and such and i i feel like on the keto circles it's been like the insulin is so villainized and said that it's such a bad thing but it's actually very useful if you activate it at the right time and if you use it for like muscle growth because you can't really build muscle that much or that effectively without the anabolic stimulus whether that be from insulin or amino acids and such yeah exactly i mean ultimately our bodies if we just look back um, obviously in the past our bodies are designed to fast and to feast you know let's just go back to the caveman days um, and this is a good segue into some other things we can talk about, but if we could just go back to those, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, um, obviously if we could just go, to, if we just look at winter mm -hmm. and summer, um, winter, we would, you know, kill animals and eat as much as we possibly could because, you know, you don't know when you're going to kill an animal again, it might be a week, might be two weeks. So let's just say again, you killed an animal you would eat as much as you possibly could, maybe 10,000 calories of meat and fat. Mm -hmm. And then um, you would probably fast, you know, not willingly, but <laughs> you know, you would be fasting yeah. for potentially days um, again, because there's no fruits and vegetables in, in Northern climates. And then summer rolls around and obviously there's fruits in abundance in, in certain places and vegetables and we would probably feast on, on fruit. So our bodies are designed, in my opinion, to go back and forth. However, I think one key point when people have to look at these diets and, and say, is this for me, is look at your DNA, right? And there's a lot of levels to this. So I'm going to just start with the big picture, which is which zone are, are you from? So for an example, I'm Canadian. Um, I think you're Northern European as well. And mm -hmm. my genetics are almost all Northern European. And, you know, we're designed to obviously do very well with high fat diets because of the climate, right? If we look at our, again, what our diets would have been like tens of thousands of years ago, uh, even thousands of years ago, that's what we had to deal with, right? And there is a lot of epigenetic changes that happen, right? And just, just to define epigenetics for those of you that don't know, it's, you know, our environment, what we eat, what we feel is always turning on and turning off certain genes. 
And there's a great book on this topic by my friend Dawson Church called The Genie in Your Genes. It's uh, essentially being used as a, as a reference guide in, in universities, as a study guide. It's a great book. So if you understand epigenetics, that's the king. But it, and not that long ago, I believe it was last year, there was a mind-blowing experiment they did with worms that they found that epigenetics were passed on 18 generations. Mm-hmm. So, so what does this mean? It means that you know, what, your, <laughs> you know, what your ancestor ate you know, really like a thousand years ago is on some level affecting you today. And a lot of that is, you know, there's a lot of the genes which we can get into if we really want to get nerdy around uh, how our bodies are going to metabolize certain fats, saturated fats, uh, even fasting. Because, you know, right now I live in Panama and obviously it's a tropical climate. There's fruits all year long. There's vegetables all, all year long. Um, and the genetics here are different. People metabolize carbs and even starches uh, very differently than I would. Mm-hmm. So, and again, a lot of that is just adaptation and epigenetics that have been passed on for a very long time. Um, and, and if you look at people too, with Mediterranean genetics, there's an abundance of food all, the, all year round, right? Olives mm-hmm. and different um, things. So these people, for an example, don't typically do that well with uh, fasting, right? Mm-hmm. And it can be a stressor. So a good friend of mine, when he fasts, his HRV drops, his heart rate goes up. Like mm-hmm. it's obviously a stressor for me. I had the opposite response, mm-hmm. um, you know, tracking with the aura ring and some other devices. Um, when I fast, my HRV goes up, my heart rate goes down, like it, my body likes it. Mm-hmm. So it's a really a key point um, and we can get deeper into that, but the DNA part, the ancestral part is a huge, huge key in really understanding what type of diet is optimal for our bodies. Mm, yeah. So true. Yeah. Like, uh, the, uh, ancestry and genetics is, it has a, like this huge effect, uh, even like the, um, things that you, you can tolerate in terms of like allergens and such. You know, like uh, there's a reason why certain populations don't do well with dairy and uh, do, don't, don't do well with gluten, for instance, because they haven't like been exposed to it in the past. So, yeah, definitely like kind of keeping in mind that all these diets are actually uh, affected by your past epigenome. And at the same time, you are affecting your future genome as well. So it's a kind of kind of uh, kind of inter- interesting point to have to always keep in mind that, OK, what I'm eating right now it's going to affect my offspring in the future as well. So yeah, I would think, I would think that's why it's important to kind of maintain this sort of a resilient metabolism that is still able to you know, kind of tolerate different kinds of nutrients uh, just because you don't know what kind of a future there's going to be like in a few decades or like 100 years. Mm, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a good point is to think about, uh, think about your, your, ans- your, your kids and your offspring. Um, but, you know, even eating out of season, there was a really interesting study done eating cherries that I'll just reference here. And uh, there was a down regulation of a couple of genes, BMOL1 and QI1. And uh, basically, you know, if you think about even our, our, our minds can tell, hey, this is summer, right? Mm-hmm. There's longer days, the, the climate is warmer, and our, our bodies can obviously tell when it's winter, it's colder. Uh, the UV rays from the sun are a different uh, set of UV rays. And obviously our body has a very deep intelligence. So even eating stuff out of season has been shown in studies that it, it, it doesn't get um, processed the same way, which is really fascinating too. Mm-hmm. Um, so even eating with the seasons, and, and I know that some people think like that, there is some actual science that seems to indicate that there's something to that. Mm, yeah, I've, I've also seen like some studies or heard about that uh, feeding mice like off off season fruit or something is gonna result in like more fat gain just because it's like off season yeah. or something. Yeah, it's crazy. So the other big consideration when you're thinking about your personal optimization of your diet um, is really what you ate as a kid. So okay, we looked at the DNA from the ancestors, but you know. And, and this is a personal opinion um, and, and theory, although I think I feel pretty confident in it. So 
And that's what you ate as a kid is one of the main uh, creators of your gut bile. And, you know, because gut biome is very difficult to, to change um, because, you know, when you're talking about colonizing and stuff that's been colonized, um, I think what you ate as a kid was a huge part of it. And you just, just from personal experience, and I've talked to a lot of people, and I've looked at a lot of people, and what I've observed, for an example, is, you know, I didn't grow up with rice. So mm-hmm. I used to go to Japan a lot. And when I would eat rice there, I would get constipated. Like I don't have the gut biome to eat rice. Mm -hmm. But, you know, my dad is a potato farmer. You know, my grandfather was a potato farmer. So I grew up with potatoes. I can eat probably like two pounds of potatoes and feel Mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. And that's a really interesting thing too. Even with blood sugar, and there's been a lot of tests with this, where different people will eat different foods, which if you just looked at the glycemic index and the carb levels, theoretically, they should have a certain glycemic response, but they don't, Mm -hmm. right? So then the question is, well, why is that? And I think the the logical answer is the gut biome because, you know, your gut biome is going to eat the food, right? It's going Mm -hmm. to actually break down a lot of the food that you eat, which I'm going to give you another um, piece of evidence on, on this theory which is when I did my biome tests, you know, when you do a biome test, you send them a, a piece of fecal matter and then they analyze it. And they tell you based on the gut biome we found, here's the foods that you should eat a lot of and here's the foods that you should avoid. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I started doing in, and more for nutritional insurance is on Thursdays, I create this, you know, two and a half, three pound salad. Okay. <laughs> and it's, loaded with all of the foods that my gut biome has and wants to eat. Mm-hmm. Now, it was, what happens when I eat it is really fascinating because I eat it, my, number one, my weight doesn't go up and uh, like the next day and there's almost nothing that comes out the next day. It's like mm-hmm. my body, even though I'm eating you know, an extreme amount of, of vegetables, Mm-hmm. my body just devours it, right? So it's things like watercress, um, right. arugula, which again, for my body, um, I've got just the, the biome to just devour through that. Mm. And I think that's a big consideration too. So is, is what did you eat as a kid? Um, you know, is it probably a strong indicator to certain foods that you can uh, enjoy a lot of and even certain foods to avoid. So that's mm-hmm. another big thing to look at. Yeah, yeah. Like for so as a kid, I was used to eating a lot of uh, cereal and uh, ramen noodles. So what yeah. does that mean? What does that mean for me? <laughs> well, you know, I ate a lot of cereal too. I mean, I I, I really did. I'm surprised that I never had diabetes, but you know, I and I still have a very strong sweet tooth. Um, so my actually my ability to eat sugar, um, you know, even Wade will comment like it's <laughs> it's impressive, <laughs> which I do on Sundays, right? Like when I mm. eat carbs, I eat a lot of sugar. Right. So I probably have a lot of gut biome that can uh, very efficiently eat sugar. So mm-hmm. you probably have the same thing as well, um, where, again, and we have to be mindful of the health consequences sure. of cranking our blood sugar too much. But, you know, I've actually measured my glucose response. And, again, uh, my body is able to just devour sugar. Cause mm-hmm. it, and I think it's the gut biome that I built as a kid. Yeah, I, I, I see that as well. So like, for instance, um, I can yeah, tolerate like gluten and uh, carbs and everything like the sugary and insulin spiking very well. Like I don't have any blood sugar issues from it. And I don't feel like in a brain coma the next day, like I feel just fine and perfectly like uh, alert and focused, even if mm-hmm. I'm having like something that has gluten or such. Because in the past, like, you, or like there is again, like this very narrative that okay you must avoid bread all the time because you're gonna get brain fog you're gonna get like all these different gut disorders etc which may be true for some people but again in my own example i don't feel any difference and that's why i also like to incorporate like these let's say bad carbs on on certain days on like on those that maybe like these reefy days just so my body could have maintain the ability to handle and and uh, mm-hmm. just so my kind of change the uh, the metabolic response as well yeah, just just to shift gears here, I, I think the biggest thing to avoid 
is inflammatory foods. Hmm. Like I, I think sugar isn't that much of a threat to the body compared to in, infl inflammatory foods. And of course, sugar can be inflammatory if it's abused. But fats, bad fats hmm. and bad protein is way more inflammatory than sugar. And uh, if you think about, for an example, like one of the biggest upgrades I've made to my diet was to eliminate A1 protein, right? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, once in a while I might have it, but A1 protein is the protein from most of the cows around the world. So most of the cow-based dairy products, cheeses and milks, mm -hmm. come from, are made from A1 protein. And um, I had kind of intuitively moved away from that. But then when I learned about A1 protein, I'm like, well, let me try A2. And I started doing that and I had no issues. So I can eat sheep and goat and, you know, all of those types of dairy products and have no problems. And I've talked to a lot of people that thought they were lactose intolerant, but it, it appears it's really, it was the protein that was an issue. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the same thing with bad fats, right? Um, you know, inflammatory fats, you know, obviously vegetable oils and other things, rancid fats are, are way more of a threat to your health than uh, sugar. So mm -hmm. again, yeah. you know, sugar uh, will create some insulin resistance if it's chronically elevated. But yeah. I think ultimately um, optimizing your fats and your proteins based on are they inflammatory or not is, is a real big key. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Like, although sugar is going to spike your insulin and it may like ravage your arteries and such, it's, it's not going to stay around for like too long if you do it like just briefly, if you consume it briefly, because you will just burn it off for energy and you, your body doesn't like store sugar uh, as something that can't be removed easily like it will just be burnt right. off as glycogen or just burnt off for energy but like fats and proteins your body can really easily store them for longer than just 24 hours or such you you, you actually store the fats you eat in your adipose tissue and uh, you make and up the, the cells yeah right? exactly like the cells are going to be made up of the bad fats that you ate so uh, that's like a huge huge difference in terms of like the food quality and such yeah, and it lingers around, um, you, you know, and I think a lot of body fat, like it's inflammation, right? I mean, of course, there's body fat, but, you know, when I, when I coach people, um, there's weight loss, but then there's inflammation, and it's always interesting to see. It takes about three to four weeks, and, you know, when they start, when they start eliminating bad fats and cleaning up their protein, um, there's a massive reduction in just inflammation, not just body fat. Mm -hmm. And you can, you know, and once inflammation is reduced, the other thing I've noticed um, is that it seems to get literally two or three or four times easier to lose body fat. Yeah. So <clears throat> when people, again, if, if I coach someone and they're eating, um, they want to do a spike day, a refeed day, I, I'm still really mindful. I'm, again, eat the carbs, but I, I try to tell them, hey, be mindful of the inflammation because that's going to linger the entire week, right? Mm -hmm. um, again, the carbs, you're going to burn them by Wednesday if you're working out, but the inflammation is going to hang around. Like, so if you're pounding a lot of, um, again, A1 protein and other bad fats or too much of it, and again, you know, I, I'm mindful that the the poison is in the dosage, as Tim Ferriss said, in four hour body. It's a really important mindset. But yeah, inflammation really lingers. And um, mm. I think it's a really interesting ver factor in fat loss that we haven't really broken down. But I I've just seen it over and over again with myself and with other people that once the inflammation drops, fat loss becomes easy. And when if there is inflammation, it's like the calorie equation of calories in, calories out doesn't seem to apply the same way, you know? Mm. So that's really interesting. Mm. Yeah, it's so true. Like if you're inflamed, then you're more likely to be storing the calories you eat as fat as well and more, more, do it more easily. Yeah, yeah, but, I, I think so, 100%. Right, but what, what would be like some of the tests that uh, people can do to you know, assess what's their like optimal diet then? Yeah, so first of all, I think um, there's the Cyrex tests on, in, on, inflamed, on the, sorry, allergies. Um, so that's one of the better 
allergy tests you can do. So CyrexLabs.com um, is, in my opinion, probably one of the best foods allergies and sensitivities. Because again, there's probably, so let's just talk about what an allergy is. Um, it's basically your body being threatened by undigested proteins. Mm -hmm. So it means your body is not able to break down that particular protein into amino acids. And that's very threatening to the body. Um, in fact, there's a great book that came out um, not that long ago called The Longevity Code. And they believe that the number one killer of supercentenarians is an agglomeration of protein into the cells. Mm -hmm. So protein over time is a killer you know, in, inside of our cells because the cells just stop working the way they should. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll get into what I think is a great solution in a sec. But the point is that even if you do a, a, an allergy test like Cyrex, you're going to see a range, right? So some stuff, I mean, some stuff, you know, you're going to the hospital and your, your throat closes. That's an extreme allergic response. But a lot of things are going to have a low level allergic response, which are still going to create a lot of inflammation and problems. So the Cyrex test is a good one to do. Um, another great, again, kind of biofeedback thing that's simple to do is if you eat food and it feels heavy in your stomach, or you're getting too much gas, or you're getting acid reflux, mm -hmm. those are always signs that you should probably not eat that. Or if you want to eat that, make sure you take enzymes like Masszymes or Gluten Guardian or Capex mm -hmm. um, in order to break that down. There's something in there that your body's struggling to break down. The other thing too, which I'm really excited to, I, I, I predict that in the next 12 months, I'm actually talking to a company um, that has a biofeedback device to help them integrate that in it, is HRV immediately after a meal. Right. Mm -hmm. So HRVs are heart rate variability, which if something is good for us and our bodies are calm and relaxed, there's a bigger variance between the heartbeats. And if something is stressful, that variance drops. Mm -hmm. So what I want um, is, okay, you know, I just ate, um, you know, a plate of, of, <laughs> of cow milk, uh, <laughs> of cheese, and, you know, see my HRV drop right in the next hour or two and actually start creating kind of a diary, um, a digital diary of my response to different foods. I, I think that's another great way to see um, how our body is responding. Cause that, cause I do look at that. Um, and for an example on Sundays, uh, which I would, I eat a lot of food. If I eat certain foods, I, my HRV goes down. Like I, I see that response. Mm -hmm. So those are ways to do it. The other, the other great tool, which we can open up a can of worms here, is really kinesi applied kinesiology, muscle mm -hmm. testing, which a lot of chiros and nutritionists and some naturopaths are, are big into. I've been doing um, applied kinesiology for about 10 years. I've, I mean, I've probably done literally hundreds of thousands of muscle tests and calibrations. So in a lot of ways, that is the best test because it kind of accounts all the things that we may not even understand, mm -hmm. right? If I just muscle test, is it in my highest and best interest for me to eat this food? Um, and I get a no, well, there's probably some, again, unknown reason that I don't understand yet that is indicating that I should not be eating that. So I'm a big, big fan of applied kinesiology and muscle testing um, on the food level and even calibrating food. So you can create a scale, for example, saying, hey, from zero to 100, where 100 is the healthiest food I could eat for my body, this food calibrates about 50, 60, 70, and you know, and find that number. Um, so I've gone to that level where I've calibrated different fats and different proteins and even different types of uh, refeed food <laughs> to try to minimize the inflama inflammatory response. And um, it's worked very, very well. So mm. those are, I think, are my, my tools to, to help people find the right self. Well, yeah, it look, looks like you have it all uh, planned out and uh, dialed down with uh, what you're eating. Uh, would would the, like, the kinesiology test 
can it be used like after a meal as well? Like looking at uh, how much your muscle strength you have after eating something. Well, no, you can actually test it. Like you can test it even before you eat it. Like, so mm -hmm. if you're looking at different foods, cause it's, cause it's a non-local response. Uh, back in the seventies, John Diamond, uh, who was kind of one of the main guys who taught kinesiology, what they would do, they would just kind of put food on their chest and then muscle tests and people mm. would go, strong or weak um so they would do that with aspartame and different things but um what we found in the last little while is that i can just think about a food you know i can think about you know let's say again i can think about cow's milk and hold it in mind and even though i might not even eat it even though it's my, i might not even hold it mm -hmm. um my body will still have a strong or weak response and of course you can hold stuff to your chest, but as long as you hold it in mind, um, it, it works very, very, very well. Mm -hmm. So, but it's a skill and you have to practice and you, you know, you, you get better at muscle testing, but mm -hmm. I think muscle testing and food is a great way to learn muscle testing. You know? mm. Yeah. Because it's, it's almost like your gut bacteria are sending you the signals <laughs> to telling you don't eat it or uh, the opposite. Uh, but let's talk about like the enzymes now. Um, yeah. what, what would be like some enzymes that you yourself use uh, to to improve your diet? Yeah, so I think I think enzymes and probiotics are the two most important. I mean, let's call them nutrients that you can consume that will enhance any diet because they're really the workers, right? If we look at uh, food as just you know, we, let's take a, let's take a metaphor, right? So if we take food and we look at it as a tree and we want to build a house first we have to chop up that wood into planks right in order to build the house so what does that chopping is the enzymes right so the enzymes will take protein for an example and disassemble them into either amino acids or fatty acids or uh, glycogen <clears throat> mm -hmm. so from that point then our bodies can use it and then going back to allergies or even food sensitivities, uh, let's take gluten for an example. The reason gluten is extremely inflammatory for some people is because there's an enzyme called DPP4 in the intestinal lining that a lot of people don't have a lot of genetically or none. Mm -hmm. So celiacs, for example, practically have no DPP4 in their intestinal lining, which means that they cannot break down gluten, which is actually a protein, into amino acids. So we have an enzyme called gluten guardian, which is DPP4, and it, it can break down the casing of that protein, and then your body can use the aminos. Mm -hmm. So and continuing with the tree metaphor, so first we have to break that down. But the other thing enzymes do, and they do 25,000 different functions in your body from thinking to blinking, is they actually will reassemble those uh, planks into whatever your body needs. Mm -hmm. So again, they're really the workers of your body. If you're just eating food and you're not breaking things down, first of all, you're going to have some serious health problems. <laughs> um, but your body is not going to be able to build the proteins it needs, the neurotransmitters it needs, the fatty acids that you know, your, your cells need. And I'll give you an example. Um, a good friend of mine, he's, he's 77 now. His name is Frank. And I, he started taking masszymes around five years ago. So he was on antidepressants for decades, mm -hmm. right? And if you think about one of the main reasons I believe, and, and again, uh, this is just my opinion, that uh, a lot of people have um, depression issues and other brain-related issues is just a lack of neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. And a neurotransmitter is essentially a protein, an amino acid, that your body can make. So if you're not getting enough amino acids from your food, your, your body's going to struggle to make certain neurotransmitters. And as soon as he started taking masszymes, he got off all his meds and hasn't been on since. Mm. Um, so again, that's just one example. But the other thing too, for anti-aging, again, if we go back to the protein agglomeration, the protein accumulation in the cells, um, I think the two big things that will fight that is fasting and proteolytic enzymes. Mm -hmm. So we've designed um, an enzyme which has more protease per capsule than anyone else called masszymes. 
It's been around for over 15 years. And it, what it does, it has different types of protease, which will break down the protein into aminos. And then we have actually another ingredient called astrazyme, which will bring you know, up to 66% more aminos through the intestinal tract and actually help rebuild your body. And that's one of the main reasons why Wade, who's a vegetarian, is able to eat 60, 70, 80 grams of protein a day, um, which kind of defies common, even right. defies what most people in the industry would believe, right? Yeah. You can't be 200 pounds and eat 70 grams of vegetarian protein a day. Yeah. Um, but I think, he does. I think, you, I think you won like the Canadian championships with that as well or something. I, Correct. In, in, yeah, in, he in, won. In bodybuilding, yeah. Yeah, he would in, in natural bodybuilding, which is even more mm. impressive. Because um, again, most vegetarians, for an example, and I've seen it many, many times, and Wade's seen it many, many times, um, they'll lose like 20 pounds of muscle, usually in the first three or four months. Like if somebody goes 100% vegetarian, they'll start losing that much muscle mass. Unless, and again, it's because a lot of vegetarian proteins are actually very difficult to break down, right? Mm. They're actually difficult to disassemble. So that's where proteolytic enzymes are really helpful. The other thing too is if you take proteolytic enzymes on an empty stomach, let's say when you're fasting, mm -hmm. um, it's a great idea because they'll actually go into your body, go into your bloodstream and actually start breaking down old undigested proteins, which mm -hmm. might be accumulating in the cells or even creating inflammatory or allergic responses. Mm -hmm. So that's the enzyme side. And then we're, we, we're just launching uh, this July a new product called Capex. And this is designed for people on keto, paleo, or low-carb diets. So first of all, it does three things. One is it dramatically will improve fat digestion. It has four different lipases. It has HCL and dandelion root, which actually stimulates bile. Mm. And bile is mm. really powerful to break down fats. So you're going to break down the fats you eat into a lot more fatty acids, which is what you want. Then we have several other ingredients such as L-carnitine, InnoSlim, 7-keto DHEA, and which will help transport the fatty acids into the mitochondria, into the liver. And like InnoSlim, for example, will stimulate AMPK and other things mm. and other um, enzymes that will help break down the fatty acids. So I would say it's the most powerful non-nervous system stimulating energy booster I've ever tried and other people that have tried the samples have said the same thing. Mm -hmm. So what you do, and, and I made the mistake twice. Um, so the first time I got the samples, I, it was like 4 p.m. and I took five capsules on an empty stomach <laughs> and that night, I think I fell asleep at like four in the morning, you know, um, which was interesting. So then I, and I said, I decided two weeks ago, I'm going to recreate that experiment. So I took five capsules around three or 4 PM and I, same thing. It took me, according to my sleep monitor, it took me two hours and 55 minutes to fall asleep. Usually it takes me 20. <laughs> um, and again, it's not a nervous system response. It's that we're getting so much fatty acids into the mitochondria and we're helping the mitochondria burn those fatty acids. We also have mm. CoQ10 right. um, and we have things that make the mitochondria actually get bigger and stronger. Uh, that combination of feeding the mitochondria and making the mitochondria stronger, it's just uh, incredible for energy. So that's the mm. second thing it does. And the third thing it does and, and again, I don't want to make any crazy promises here, but um, a lot of the ingredients have been shown to help with fat loss. So again, it, I would say it's, it's a minor fat loss enhancer, assuming you're in a calorie deficit, right? Mm -hmm. Again, we're not going to say that it's right. this crazy fat burner. Um, I don't think there is any crazy fat burner, but theoretically, a lot of the ingredients have been shown to help with fat loss. For example, 7-keto DHEA has been shown to increase your, your basic metabolic rate by as much as, you know, 5%, which is about a pound a month. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it, again, in a calorie deficit, that makes a big difference. Right. So that's coming out in July. Uh, you, uh, 
you can click uh, Sim's link uh, to, to get a bottle. But so just to recap, we have different types of enzymes. We have gluten guarding, which if you're having refeed days or you're eating bread or pasta, that's my go-to. Um, I, I, I consume quite a bit of gluten guarding on Sundays. Um, if you're kind of eating a normal diet and, and you're really into maybe in bodybuilding or you're eating a lot of protein, uh, Masszymes is incredible. Mm -hmm. And now for people, again, on keto or people that just want more energy or people on even paleo or low carb, uh, Capex is the answer. So again, mm -hmm. it's just different blends of enzymes to really maximize the br nutrient breakdown. And it's not just breaking things down, it's the passing them through your intestinal tract and then the assimilation, mm -hmm. right? Because again, the enzymes will help rebuild other proteins. Like you, so you think about it again, it cuts the wood down into planks, but it then actually reassembles it. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're talking about building muscle or, you know, and even if you're not a bodybuilder, you, you really want to prevent muscle loss. Like muscle mm -hmm. loss is a very negative thing. It's a catabolic thing, um, which if you think about even your organs are made out of protein, um, you, you don't want to be catabolic. So even if you're not, you don't want to build muscle mass, that's fine. But at the very least, you want to preserve your muscle mass. Um, for a lot of reasons. And, and when you get older, you know, people in their 80s and 90s especially, a, a, a lot of what kills them is actually the lack of muscle mass for mm -hmm. a lot of reasons. One is they, they don't have the muscle to maintain their balance, so they fall, and of course their bones are brittle, um, and they break their hips, and usually that's the beginning of the end. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I know a lot of elderly people that that's essentially what happened. They fell, broke their hips, and then, you know, not very long after they passed yeah. away because they can't move, <laughs> right? So it just becomes this spiraling descent. Mm -hmm. So anyways, my point is that I think um, enzymes for anti-aging on multiple levels is really critical because you want to clean the cells yeah. of, of the proteins as well as preserve your muscle mass. Mm, yeah, <laughs> that's a great uh, rundown of all these uh, enzymes. And I do agree a whole lot that, Improving improving your digestion is going to uh, help to achieve like whatever goal you have related to diet, whether that be muscle growth, whether that be fat loss, just general mm. well being, depression, and as well as like you mentioned anti aging because like you, if you have a lot of these unbroken down like let's face it like I would imagine like almost ninety percent of people have some form of like a digestive uh, issue or something like at least it's like suboptimal and uh, they just yeah. Would benefit for some like digestive aid, whether that be just like some increased hydrochloric acid or some uh, digestive enzymes and, 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 and such. And the few things that you mentioned was that um, I want to point out well, like um, that if you take those enzymes like in a fasted state, then you help to break down those uh, like nutrients that are floating or those undigested nutrients in your bloodstream. So uh, in theory, mm -hmm. you can also like accelerate autophagy and these other yeah. benefits of the fast faster because. Your, your body won't really go into autophagy if it hasn't burned through the nutrients that are you know that you ate the last time so if you're eating something food and you're fasting but your body isn't breaking down the nutrients that are in your bloodstream or the nutrients in your gut then you probably aren't going to get the autophagy benefits either because you know there's the signal is there that you have like food and we're not going to go into autophagy so yeah using those enzymes is definitely something to kind of burn through that kind of store energy much faster and uh, go into the self-eating mode after that well yeah and, and i just talked to a doctor um last week and uh i got to be very careful what i say here but let me just put it to you this way he's a big fan of using our enzymes um on a on a fasted state to help break down in his opinion it helps break down um, other things in the body, for example, potentially things like tumors and even mm. you know cancer growth. Because I mean, when your body is not eating and you're fasting, and autophagy kicks in, it's not just eating old nutrients, but things like tumors. Um, so again, the two guys that I know that fasted for 40 days, one of them had this massive tumor and he fasted for 40 days and it was gone. So why is that? Because again, the body can take all of its enzymes 
in all of its natural healing capacity and start breaking things down. Mm -hmm. And the doctor that um, I talked to, he's a big fan of using proteolytic enzymes like mass signs mm -hmm. to help accelerate that. Mm -hmm. So again, when you do fast, um, it's a great idea to take, for example, wake up and take five or 10 capsules in an empty stomach. Um, let's assume you're eating at dinner then your, your body's going to have accelerated autophagy or if you're fasting for longer periods of time, um, take some multiple times a day. Mm. And even before bed, a, a lot of people report uh, better sleep and less sleep, you know, waking up more refreshed with higher quality sleep, which is really, you know, the game, uh, by actually taking mass signs before bed, like three, four, five capsules. And, you know, I, I've been tracking my sleep since the Aura Ring came out. And one of the things that certainly wrecks sleep is having, pro, uh, having food in your belly. Mm. So if you ate, even if you ate, let's say at 6 or 7 p.m., but you're eating food that, again, is not maybe optimal for your body and your body's struggle to, struggling to break that down, um, by taking enzymes and actually breaking it down, you're going to have better sleep than having maybe proteins and fats that are lingering ar around in your gut. Mm -hmm. Um, and then your, your, the blood pools around your stomach and all of the other things that happen when we're trying to break food down. Um, so you can usually have better sleep in, in my experience by, mm. yeah. by like, taking some. I had some additional thoughts while you were talking that, you know, f for me example, like I don't have any digestive problems. I don't have constipation or SIBO or uh, low stomach acid or such. I can pretty much digest anything and feel pr pretty well and do no problems in that regard. But I still think like, even then, like for healthy people, using some enzymes would be like a very strategic and very clever thing yeah. because, uh, first of all, like you, you do get digestive enzymes from uh, real food and uh, that's going to help to break down those, those, those calories and those nutrients. But the problem is that... Well, let's be, let's, let's be clear, right? You're only getting enzymes from raw, organic, right. <laughs> like unpasteurized, like uh, no pesticides, no fungicides, yeah. uh, food, like uncooked, raw you know, mm. absolutely organic. That's the only time you actually have enzymes in food. The rest of the time, as soon as we cook it or spray it, the enzymes are gone. So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But uh, there's also that your body also has like this reserve of enzymes, but th that reserve is somewhat limited. Like there's only like a certain amount of enzymes that your body can produce itself. And if you run through your enzymes, you run through your own, or own body's enzymes, then you're going to essentially like accelerate aging as well. Because like you mentioned yeah. earlier, those enzymes govern like everything starting from blinking and uh, thinking and uh, digesting and everything. So using digestive enzymes, even as a healthy person, is like an anti-aging yeah. strategy because you're preserving your own body's enzyme reserves and you're going to put less stress on the digestion, even if it's like healthy food, like organic, et cetera, et cetera. Minimizing, <laughs> minimizing that effect is like something that like everyone would benefit from. And uh, that's, I think it's, it's something that's really effective. Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, there's been all kinds of really interesting experiments and research done with uh, proteolytic enzymes and recovery in sports and basically doubles the speed of recovery. So if you're working out, uh, proteolytic enzymes is a no brainer. And here's, here's an interesting pro tip, which um, very few people know, and that's actually to do your protein drink and mix mass enzymes in it and sip it while you're lifting. This, if you're looking to gain muscle mass or actually uh, improve performance, sipping basically you're sipping a pre-digested amino acid drink at that mm. point, and you'll actually taste the protein change into amino acids. Like it takes about maybe 15, 20 minutes. You'll see all the bubbles coming out. But as soon as you lift, as soon as you 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 stress the muscle, mm. your muscle wants to start recovering immediately right? There's an immediate response. It's, I mean, yeah, it keeps going for 48 to 72 hours. But you, so if you're having um, the, uh, the, the right amino acid mix in your bloodstream as you're lifting, there's some research that's shown that you can get better gains. So yeah, yeah. that's one little trick. And uh, one more little hack that some people use, if you have cheap protein, like cheap steaks, <laughs> that you want to tenderize. Um, Mazzimes is great for that. You can take a couple of capsules and open them <laughs> and put it on the steak yeah. and uh, you know, wait maybe an hour to 
maybe 90 minutes and it'll actually tenderize the steak, wash it, spice yeah. it and cook it. Um, so I've, I've yeah. done that and some other people have done that. Uh, yeah, well, I've seen the video on your website as well, like literally the enzymes or the messzyme capsules are breaking down steak right in front of your eyes <laughs> and it's quite Yeah, quite yeah that was, that was uh, a little longer, but yeah, but uh, it, it will actually completely incinerate mm. protein into aminos. Right. So yeah, no, it's great. And um, I think, you know, like you mentioned, uh, usually after 35, people's digestion really starts going downhill. And it could be a variety of things. It can be hydrochloric acid um, issues. Your body's not making as much stomach acid. That's a big one. The second one is a, a reduction in enzymes. That's a big one. Um, obviously, gut biome. So we have a single strain probiotic, which is really designed to kill bad bacteria in the gut. Um, you know, so that could be another issue. Again, if you have certain gluten sensitivities, gluten guardians. So, you know, our goal is to be the digestive company and to mm -hmm. create the, all the different types of solutions that based on what you need to optimize your diet. So mm -hmm. you've got everything from again hydrochloric acid to uh, P3OM, which is a probiotic, to masszymes, which is great for protein, and then Capex now for fat. You know, so, yeah. so it's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of your products as well, and uh, I don't use them every day. But if I do use them, then I don't notice. Okay, there's something like difference in just like the speed of uh, digestion or something. Uh, but but yeah, it's it's a good good uh, practice for definitely someone who has any issues. Then uh, I would imagine that th those would be like uh, something that I would recommend for uh, those to try. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. also I'm, I'm also gonna try that uh, protein shake trick, <laughs> adding the enzymes into the protein shake, and uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, the the craziest one of the craziest I think it was the craziest weightlifting workout we ever did was me Wade. And another guy, and we, we said, okay, let's try to do 300 sets. Um, so we trained pretty much nonstop, I think, for over three hours. But wow. we, we made that drink, and we were able to, to just maintain, maintain our drive uh, throughout that time. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it was, it was basically like just nonstop supersetting <laughs> for three hours. Wow. This is a crazy experiment. Um, but – you know, sipping the amino acid drink is, is a great move. Great, great. Well, it's been gr good talking with you. And uh, before I ask my last question, uh, where can people learn more about you and your work? Yeah, um, bioptimizers.com is the website. So you can just go there and, um, you know, see all of our products. Um, and again, we're, you, know, you can opt in and there's a lot of great content that we're producing on a weekly mm -hmm. basis. So mm -hmm. yeah, bioptimizers.com is the best place. So B-I-O, the buy and then optimizers. Okay. Yeah, we'll uh, leave all the link in the show notes as well. And yeah. Uh, be, like, yeah, what, my last question is, uh, what's this one piece of advice or a habit you wish you adopted sooner that improved your body and your mind? Mm. Um, I would have to say really i mean neurofeedback <laughs> i've been i've been a huge proponent and, and fan of neurofeedback for the last uh four years um wish i would have done that sooner i, I don't know if i could have done it sooner I, I probably would not have had the the money or the even the awareness of it but you know in an alternate parallel universe where i, I would have had the money yeah, that would have been it um i actually started using entrainment cds in my uh, early 20s and I did find it effective, but mm -hmm. neurofeedback in order to control your mind is uh, probably, again, one of my favorite tools. And I have a system here at home. Um, there's some commercial systems. Like, you know, it expects a massive growth in that space in the next few years. You have companies like um, uh, B Medic, which produce medical grade systems, and there's some other systems which are. Um, you know, more beginner levels, but it's really exciting time where, again, we can train our brains to, to go into different states, whether it's alpha, theta, delta, gamma, um, you know, even flow states. Mm -hmm. So that's probably been one, one of the biggest things, I guess, for the mind, which also there's just a resilience that you build, um, which your resilience is really critical because, you know, you and I or me and another person could be doing the same thing and they're completely stressed out doing the exact same thing I'm doing. Right. Uh, so if you want to be able to 
be resilient and handle more things in life without creating stress, which creates cortisol, which does all kinds of bad things epigenetically. Um, you know, meditation is really a great place, but neural feedback is probably the best tool to teach you how to meditate very, very, very quickly hmm. because literally every single second your brain is getting feedback. You're going the right, you're doing the right thing or you're doing the wrong thing, right thing, wrong thing, right thing, wrong thing. So it doesn't take that long for your brain to figure out, okay, that's what produces alpha. That's what produces theta. That's what produces gamma. Um, so that process is, is really powerful. Mm, yeah, it's so true. Like uh, meditation kind of teaches you how to become, or like, let's say yeah, meditation teaches how to become more self-aware, but with biofeedback, you're going to get like more like quantifiable data as well. And uh, like actual, well, you're, you're, you're becoming aware of the biofeedback, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're creating this incredible, um, instant, you know, loop, like in your loop that every single second you're learning from. So, mm. yeah, I think that's the ultimate too. I mean, just to, just to finish with this, I'm really excited. Um, and I would say we're five to 10 years away from having technology um, using obviously some next level blood monitoring and, and machine learning where everything we eat, going back to what I was saying earlier with HRV, but the next level of that where we eat food or we do an exercise and we're really getting instant, you know, next level insights. For example, like you just ate this and your, infl your inflammation went up 20%. Mm -hmm. um, are you going to eat that again? Probably not, right? Like, mm -hmm. are you, you going to eat less of it? Uh, so I, I know that, you know, that kind of feedback loop is coming around much deeper metrics than just heart rate and yeah. things like that. Um, and, and I can't wait for that to happen. I think that's going to really rev revolutionize health in general. Yeah. Yeah. Looking forward to it. <laughs> and it's an exciting time yeah. coming. All right. That's it for this episode. If you want to try the bio optimizers, digestive enzymes and the Capex new formula that they have, then head over to the show notes and you're going to find a link over there. I think virtually every person can benefit from taking some digestive enzymes and using them strategically to either improve their digestion or to just promote longevity and anti-aging because they do are helping a lot with many different kinds of ailments and uh, even just optimizing general muscle growth, fat loss and uh, even like cognition. So I highly recommend them and they're the top digestive enzymes on the market. You can also support the show by leaving us a review on iTunes and tagging us on Instagram and the other social media platforms. But other than that, thanks for listening. My name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.